Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Panel of speakers. Uh, starting on the right there, we have Dave S. from The Great Fat Group, Casey M. from Bethany Lane, and Logan M. from The Six Cents. The Six Sense group. <laughs> That's harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, they'll be sharing their experience on steps eight and nine, which are made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And step nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. My name's Logan. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Logan. And I'm pretty nervous because Winslow is a really tough act to follow. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, you know, when I was asked to do this commitment, you know, I felt cool because I was here last year, and uh, I remember sitting down and I remember learning a lot about these steps. I remember hearing a lot of really good speakers, and it was a privilege and an honor for me to be asked to uh, to come here and speak today. Um, service is extremely important for me. I mean, about two months ago, uh, the chips were down and I wasn't feeling so hot, and like the thoughts of drinking were going on. And in my head, I said, "Well, I might drink." But I'm going to wait until after I have to speak at the service commitment. I'm going to wait until after I have to take my sponsee through this four step, right? And those are things that kept me from drinking on that day, and they kept me from drinking on the next day. So the three parts of this program, you know, when two are failing or one is failing, I still have the others. You know, service helps me a lot. So I'm going to share with you guys a little bit about my experience with the eighth and ninth step. Um, <clears throat> I had the pleasure of uh, being at an eight step meeting last night. Um, at my home group, so I feel charged and ready to rock on this one. So the eighth step, um, you know, made a list of all persons we had harmed. It says, you know, right when we get there in the big book that we've already made that list when we did our fourth step. And when I sat down to do my fifth step with my sponsor, I didn't read that part. I missed the part about the harms, and he reminded me that, uh, you know, I should have done that. So I sat down and I did it, and I wrote down some harms. And the crazy thing about that is uh, the – the amount of stuff that came out on that eight-step list was very small compared to what I've added to it since then. Because I will be driving down the road, and I will remember about that Twinkies I stole from 7-Eleven on Jaredsville Pike seven years ago that I totally forgot about. I'll be hanging out with some old friends from high school, and they'll remind me about that one time. I totally shorted them, or I totally you know, stiffed them on five bucks or what have you, and I will continue to add to that list. You know, My mind is very forgetful, and I caused a lot of, lot of harm. Um, the way I drank, the way I roll was... If you cared about me, if you were close to me, if you loved me, if you did anything for me, I stabbed you in the back and I robbed you blind, right? For some reason, I didn't really like to uh, burn people on the street. I didn't really like to, you know, short people on shady drug deals or anything like that. But if you were my family, you know, if you really loved me, I ripped and ran all over you, right? So my A-step lifts got pretty big pretty quick. And, uh, you know, some of those amends were really tough to make. And I... For whatever reason, through the grace of God, I wasn't so much focused on making the amends when I made the list. But I will tell you that the first time I did an eight-step list, uh, I was probably two months sober, three months sober. I had direct directions to uh, sit down and write this list, and I decided not to do it. And I also decided not to call my sponsor. I couldn't tell you why. There was also uh, – there was no, like, conscious decision not to do it. It just kind of worked out that way. So I went about two, three weeks, no contact with a sponsor, no step work, um, just going to meetings, hanging out, and I got crazy quick. So I started working with another sponsor. We started going through the steps again. I did a thorough and fearless four-step. Um, got to the part where it was time to you know, start talking about amends. And I had this list, and we talked about it, and there were some easy ones. And it was like, yeah, no problem. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there, blah, 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 blah. We're going to do that tomorrow. Right? Not now. We're going to do that tomorrow. No problem. No sweat. So we start talking about these things. We start getting these directions. And, um, you know, he finally hounds me enough, like two, three weeks into the process. Says, All right, it's time to make some of these amends. So I'm full of fear. I really don't want to do this. And uh, I was very nervous because I have a criminal record and I had time, like, waiting for him. You know, if I messed up on anything, I was on probation. So I said to my sponsor, what happens when I walk into Royal Farms and I told them uh, – about all the stuff that I stole, all the stuff that I did, and I, you know, admit to my guilt, and they say, okay, well, we're going to call the police and press charges, and they're going to come pick you up and take you to jail. I said, what do I do then? He says, well, you go to jail, you know, <laughs> and that was not what I wanted to hear at all. Um, 
that was extremely disconcerting. I was I was kind of upset about that. I thought that was like a uh, I thought there was like a loophole in the step. Like if that happens, uh, you run or you give them an AA card and you get out of there. It's like oh no no no, it's it's cool. I'm doing a nine step. Like I'm gonna get out of here now. Uh, but that was not the case. So I, I put together this list of, uh, of amends I could make right then and there um, at a specific time, and they were mostly monetary in nature, and they uh, were mostly stores and stuff like that. Pretty much the entirety of White Marsh Mall, pretty much 90% of convenience stores in the greater Baltimore area, um, and a handful of other things like that. There were a few conversations that I had to have with close family members and stuff like that. Uh, so I went out. And uh, I had some money put together to make some of these amends, and I got in my car, and I'm chain-smoking cigarettes, and I'm shaking, and I'm driving, and I pull into these parking lots. It's like, you're going to jail. You're going to jail. This is going to go terribly. They're going to call the cops. This sucks. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. The entire time, I didn't want to do this. And I'm talking to my sponsor about that fear, and I'm telling him about that stuff. And he, he pulled that card, man. He said, you remember that one time? You know, remember that one time you said you were willing to go to any lengths for your sobriety? Damn it. So you just had to pull that one, didn't you? So I'm in the car. I'm going to all these places. And, um, you know, one by one, I walk into a store. I, I tell them, look, I stole from you. Um, I feel like it was about this amount of money. If that amount of money is not correct, please tell me, you know, the amount of money you think I stole um, and any way I can make that right for you. And I did a couple easy ones first. Uh, there was, like, this grocery store. Um, there was a couple different convenience stores. Everybody seemed to be, you know, pretty laid back with it. This one grocery store, the manager was like, yeah, you can give me that money right about now, buddy, and then see yourself out. <laughs> the one I was most afraid of, I can't tell you why, I was so scared of Royal Farms, right? The Royal Farms on Timonium Road. I was terrified of this place because I got busted red-handed with, like, eight orange juices and, like, my jacket, like... So I don't know what I need, like, eight Tropicana orange juices for, but I had to steal on that particular day and a million other things. So I go there to make the amends, and, uh, you know, I asked to speak with the manager. I'm speaking with the manager, and uh, it was real easy. She said, I can absolutely do that. I'll tell you what, I will ring up a charge uh, just for an open charge for $100, blah, 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 blah. So here's the money. And she said, you know what's really great about this? From now on, whenever I see you coming in here, I know I don't have to worry about you, you know? It's like, whoa, I thought I was walking out of here in handcuffs, right? I thought my life was over after walking in here trying to tell you about this stuff, and it actually went well. Um, you know, from my recollection, it's hazy because for my first six months of sobriety, I was nuts, man. But uh, from my recollection, I, I do not believe I walked into a lot of these stores and out the gate just said, I'm an AA, I don't drink anymore, any of this stuff. I just kept it plain and simple, told them what I had done, told them what I was planning to do to make it right, and asked if there was anything else I could do. Now, the tough ones... <clears throat> the tough ones were my family, right? And the two people I harmed the most in my family were my mother and my grandmother. And I got to sit down with my grandmother and I had a conversation with her. And it was discussed with my sponsor that I was not going to sit there and tell her about every single detail of all the things I did in her house because that would have probably given her a heart attack and killed her. So I sat there and I told her in a general way some of the stuff that went down, how I planned to fix that, and you know how I was going to live from here on out. And she took it really well. Now, when it came time to make amends to my mom, there was a lot of money involved in that, and there's also a pretty big conversation because you know the bulk of harm I caused to her wasn't the money I stole. The bulk of harm was you know the way she had to feel every day in her life, knowing what I was doing, watching me do what I was doing to myself. Her son, someone she loved very much, just stealing from her hurting himself, just wanting to die every day, you know? That hurts people, you know? I really hurt my mom a lot. And part of the amends to her was that I was not going to lie to her anymore, right? From now on, Mom, I'm going to be honest to you. So I sit down and I have this conversation with my mom, and it goes really, really, really well. And she says, you know, that's wonderful, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes I just worry about you, kind of like this thing you have going on with your license right now. Did you get that fixed? I hadn't gotten that fixed, and right there, I just made amends. I said, I'm never going to lie to you again. I'm going to be honest from here on out. She says, did you get that fixed? I said, yep. <laughs> Lied right on the spot. And to a normal person, that's like this big. That's just a little white lie. It doesn't mean much. It's not that important. But for an alcoholic like me, like was discussed earlier, uh, I can't get by sober on the things I used to do when I was drunk, right? So this little white lie starts this big, and it starts to eat my insides out over the next few months, right? It took me probably two, three months to tell my sponsor about it, and it was bugging me out. Um, you know, it's like I just made the amends, said I was going to be honest from here on out, and three seconds later lied right to her face. 
So this thing starts to kill me on the inside. You know, I start to feel the effects. And, uh, you know, I'm praying for the willingness to be willing. I don't even know what that means. My sponsor just tells me to do it. You know, he tells me about some of his amends experience and, uh, you know, how he did that and how opportunities presented themselves and how he, you know, he had the courage to do it. And when it was time, when push came to shove, like he rocked and rolled and made the amends. So I kept praying for this willingness to be willing. And I stuck on the path I was on. And then all of a sudden, the whole situation blew up in my face. I mean, blew up in my face. Um, I got this huge spot of trouble at 3 in the morning in West Baltimore. It's a long story. And uh, I was faced with this, you know, point where I could either talk to my mom and I could tell her that, look, Remember that amends I made? I lied to you right then and there. You know, this has been killing me this whole time. And I need to tell you the truth about that situation. And I need to tell you the truth about what's going on inside of me from here on out, right? So I'm sitting there in the car, and it's me and her, and it's real awkward. And she's very upset with me, and I'm very upset with myself. And my mind is just going back and forth between get honest, do what you need to do, make this amends, or, dude, this sucks. This is very uncomfortable. Just keep your mouth shut, and uh, we'll keep on doing whatever we're doing. And... Praying for that willingness, you know, staying centered and trying to overcome that fear with the faith I did have, you know, I sat there and I got honest. And from that point forward, everything changed. That was just one little white lie, one little piece of amends that uh, was really holding me back. About three, four days later, I was very uncomfortable and I'm sitting in a meeting and I started meditating. And, uh, you know, inspiration started to occur within me, like it's discussed in our literature, um, you know, about, uh, about the 11th step. I start to realize how important it is to help other people. I start to comprehend the 12 step in a way I never could, all because I was just holding on to this little piece of dishonesty. And I had to clear that out of, uh, you know, what was standing between me and my relationship with God and my fellows. So the other toughest amends, and this sucks, if people can relate to this, you know exactly what I mean, is the stuff you do in sobriety, right? Now, when I got to go to stores and people and say, look, I was a terrible alcoholic drug addict, I was a lying junkie thief, and uh, I don't do those things anymore. Here's the money I owe you. How can I make it right? Blah, blah, blah. That's one thing. Um, going to people and saying, I'm a stone-cold sober, you know, not nice person, and I still stole this money from you, that's not fun to do. And that's something else I put off as far as I could. I made every single amends I could before I did that. And I'm sitting there probably six, somewhere between six and nine months sober. It's fall of 2011, and uh, – I'm miserable, and I can't figure out what's up with this emptiness inside of me, right? I cannot put my finger on it. I don't know what's going on. Um, I start talking to my sponsor, and he brings that up. He says, how are you doing with this thing? You know, have, you, have you taken care of that yet? And uh, the answer was no, I hadn't taken care of that. And we talked about it, and I could not think of one reason why I should not take care of that amends. And the nature of the amends was that I had been working at the same job my entire uh, stint in sobriety since I was about two months sober. And for my first three, four months at that job, I was stealing money out of the cash register. I was filling in stuff that didn't belong there to get extra money in my pocket. I was still a thief, you know, stone cold sober, still a thief, incapable of being honest with myself. And at some point in time, through talking with my sponsor, through talking with other people, through, you know, maintaining a relationship with God, I was able to stop those behaviors. But at the end of the day, I still owe my employer that money. I still owe my employer an amends. So the most uncomfortable thing I ever did, I went to the ATM, I pulled out money, I went to my shift that evening, uh, and shaking, very nervous, and I was like, when I walk in, I'm going to do it, when I walk in, I'm going to make this amends right off the bat, hell no, I waited all night, all night, and the second my boss said, okay, I'm getting out of here, I was like, oh, so I pulled her outside, and uh talked with her for a few minutes and I had to look somebody in the eye and tell them look I stole from you and I was dishonest from you and I harmed you dead sober and that was really uncomfortable that was not something that I wanted to do you know the beauty and magic in the amends process for me was you know contained in all that fear I had going into it right I'm gonna go to jail I'm gonna lose my job these people are gonna judge me they're not gonna want anything to do with me and doing it anyway having faith that something was going to work out, that I was going to get better, you know? And after doing those amends, after walking out, not in handcuffs, after not being hated by the people I wanted to make amends to, and, you know, coming on the other side, not just being okay, but feeling really good, that just opened up a whole new, uh, a whole new world of, you know, spiritual 
uh, connectivity, you know? I had a relationship with God after doing those amends, which was nothing like the one I had before him, you know? It really opened things up. I was becoming a different person through doing these actions, you know, as a part of these steps. And I remember probably four or five months down the road from doing amends, uh, I was getting asked to chair a lot of meetings. I was doing a lot of service work in AA. And we're talking to my sponsor. I said, dude, you know what I just realized? I haven't thought about drinking or getting high in like five months. Not like I haven't, you know, like been tempted. Like I haven't even thought about it. The idea has not even come up, not once. And that blew my mind. Not only because it hadn't happened, because I hadn't even thought about the fact that it hadn't happened. It was no longer a working part of my mind, you know? And at that point, it was so very clear, crystal clear, that the work we do here is for a purpose, that there are results for the things we do, you know? There is a solution to the problem I have, and it is found in these steps, right? And I love the eight step because it's broken down into those two parts. Not only did we make a list of the persons we had harmed, but, you know, we spent half the time becoming willing to do so. I was not willing to make any amends when I started, you know. That took a lot of prayer, and that took getting miserable. Like Winslow was talking about, pain is a great motivator, you know. And when push came to shove and I made the amends, like, I did what I had to do. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you guys that I've made every single amends I have to make, you know. I'm going to have to have a lot of money before I can do that. In addition to that, there's some, I mean, I don't see myself going to South Carolina anytime soon to make any 50 million amends I have there and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, there's a bulk I, I don't have the opportunity to do right now. And off the top of my head, I can't think of anything I'm not willing to do. But, you know, the amends I have that are ongoing, not lying to my mom, not stealing from the people around me, not treating girlfriends horribly, you know, all those things. That's stuff I got to keep up. Because when those words left my mouth, when I said those things to my mom, when I said those things to the people around me, when I made amends to myself through the process, I got to keep that up. It's not something I can go back on. I can't decide to, you know, in sobriety, in this program, decide to just stop living like that. Because it's not what I said. Those were not the words that came out of my mouth, and that is not what I'm about. The person I am today is extremely different from the person who walked into these rooms. It's extremely different from the person I was six months ago, a year ago, so on and so forth, you know. I continue to grow, and when I do not grow, I am not a happy camper. The solution provided in Alcoholics Anonymous is, I mean, abstinence from drugs and alcohol is such a small piece of what we do here you know that's just the beginning of what's offered through these steps and through this program the happiness the joy and the freedom that come as a result of doing the work of doing the actual work and putting this thing at the center of your life i have no words to describe that just like i cannot describe the pain of drinking i cannot describe the pain of living sober as an alcoholic to somebody who's not an alcoholic i can't describe to another human being the feelings i have inside just being who i am you know knowing who i am knowing my relationship with God, knowing my relationships with my fellows. The life I have is literally beyond my wildest dreams, and it came from sitting in an uncomfortable car, chain smoking cigarettes, going to stores and telling them I stole. Simple directions that didn't make any sense, but I did them anyway through the power of prayer and through the power of sponsorship and through the power of this program. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for sharing. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Casey. Casey. Hi, everybody. My sobriety date is May 11th of 2000. Um, I have a home group. It's Bethany Lane. meets on Friday nights at 8 o'clock. I have a sponsor. And um, I'm always blown away when uh, a woman asks me to sponsor her um, because they want what I have. And I tend to scratch my head and go, why? Um, But it is always an honor and a privilege to work the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous with someone who wants it. Um, My task is to give you my experience, strength, and hope with Steps 8 and 9. I will tell you right away that when first presented with the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had no desire whatsoever to do 8 and 9. I was 21 years old. When I got sober, I happened to get sober three days after my 21st birthday. So I, you know, just hung in there long enough for a legal drink. And then I was no mas. Um, so 21, I am living in my 1991 Toyota Corolla uh, that leaks oil and shakes no matter how many times you try to have it balanced, aligned, or anything like that. That's... Uh, courtesy of my one-eyed driving. Um, 
there were dents on every single part of that car. Um, I slept in that car for six months, and I came into these rooms with, like, 50 T-shirts and two pairs of pants. Um, I had a habit of taking my pants off when I was drunk. I don't know what that was about. But um, I was also looking at... Um, I like that I have pants on today. Um, I was looking at five years in federal penitentiary for ripping off $50,000 in credit cards. Um, and it was that that actually was my what happened. Um, I had the G.O.D., when I got here, the gift of desperation. And I was absolutely willing to do anything that you guys suggested that was in the first 164 pages. Um, I did everything they told me to do in AA, and I did a whole lot of things they told me not to do in AA. Um, but my willingness to stay sober was, strong, was very strong, and I do believe that that is what saved me from myself the first couple years. Um, so when I was first presented with 8 and 9, um, it involved turning myself in. I had a bench warrant out for my arrest. Um, I had a lot of people looking for me, quite frankly, um, and I had no desire to do that. Um, I had the list. I, I was told straight up, all you have to do for 8 is write a list. That's it. You're not actually showing up at anyone and doing the, I'm sorry, you're just making a list. And then you have to work to become willing. Um, so I made the list, and um, I, I sat down with my very loving sponsor and went through that list, and she said, who do you think's the easiest? And I said, probably my parents. Um, and she said, eh, wrong answer. Um, who do you think is the hardest? And I said, it would be the restaurant that I ripped off all this money to. She said, good, that's the one you do first. Um, and I stalled and I stalled and I stalled. And she lovingly said to me, why don't you go and talk to the manager who speak, who's pressing the charges? Um, I had a very interesting relationship with this man, and I had, he was on my list. Um, he put a lot of trust in me. He, um, he was kind of grooming me to sort of take over, um, and he put a lot of time and energy into um, helping me. And to completely obliterate his trust like that, it hurt him. And um, I never really thought about it that way. So it was suggested to me that I go and I talk to this man. And, um, you know, like Logan was saying, my fear was I'm going to show up and he's going to call the cops. And I'm really little. I don't like being in jail. Like, me in jail are not simpatico. I spent 12 hours in a drunk tank on LSD, and I was not a fan. <laughs> so um, I really didn't want to go to jail. Um, but I really didn't want to get drunk. And I really didn't want to go back to being the trash bag I was when I got here. And that won over my fear of jail. Thank you. Uh, so I made an appointment, like it says to do. I made an appointment. Um, I was prepared for a nice chat with him. I was not going to grovel. I was not going to make excuses for my behavior. He knew why I stole all that money. He knew. There was no need to do all that. It was simply going in, yes, there's a certain amount of apology in there, but it's more about them. It's more about making it right for them. So I went in there. I wouldn't say my head was held high, and I wouldn't say that I was crawling, because in our literature it says we do not crawl before anyone. I went in there with faith that I will not be dropped, that I have to go do this to clear away the wreckage of my past so I can be that happy, joyous, and free. 
So I sat there and I said, look, you know what I'm here for. You know that I ruined your trust. You know that I jeopardized your business. And I would very much like to be able to make that right. And if you want me to go to jail, I will go to jail. If you want me to pay back every single cent, no matter how long it takes, I will do that too. What can I do to make this right for you? And um, he, he went off on me. Like he, he had a lot of choice words to say. And I let him. Because again, it's not about me. It's not about justifying my behavior. It's about making right. The word amend is to change, and I have to change. I'm a fighter by nature, and I was not going to fight. I was not going to argue my position. I was going to simply sit there and make it right in the universe. When he was done, he very matter-of-factly said, you will pay back every single cent. You're going to meet with my accountant. You're going to set up a, a payment schedule, and you're going to keep that. You miss one payment, you go to jail. And shaking, I think I went, okay, and, and got out of there before the cops showed up. I still wasn't totally comfortable with being there. Um, and because I did that hardest one first, it made all the other ones that much better. Now, we had discussed that um, I thought my easiest amends are going to be to my parents. We hurt the ones that love us the most, worse than anyone. And I got that look, that look that everybody in here knows, that please, God, you're killing yourself. Please stop. Please. I got that look from them over and over and over and I'm Irish Catholic alcoholic. My parents are Irish Catholic alcoholics from Woodside, Queens. So I am naturally mouthy, and I have a bad attitude a lot of the time. So the reason why I thought it would be easy to do the amends process with my parents is because though they were alcoholic, they had been sober in these rooms for a very long time. And I thought, Psh, well, they're going to know. And they're going to be like, good girl, okay. You need a 20? I mean, that's, that's in my head how it was going to go. But then it was reminded to me the times that I would come home drunk and physically assault my mother and steal her car. It was reminded to me the times that I would just be gone for days at a time and come home at 4 a.m. to my dad sitting in his chair, hair all tousled, with dark circles under his eyes. Like, all right, you're alive. Care to explain this? And he would pull out a bunch of alcohol substitute type things. And all those times that I hurt them over and over. I lied. I stole. I think these are just, you know, part of being an alcoholic. It's the AA resume. Did you lie? Yes. Did you steal? Yes. Um, so it was about being the daughter that they deserve. And yes, I did the, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was such a lousy daughter. Um, but that was the beginning. That was the seed that got planted. And my job is to be the daughter that they deserve. So when I say I'm going to do something and I say I'm going to be somewhere for them, I do it. Because all those times that I went MIA when they were expecting me, that's how I changed that behavior. Um, I stole from my mother. I stole her car. I would physically assault her. My mother fell into bad health not too long ago. Um, she's no longer able to drive. 
um, and she has a lot of medical issues. And I can tell you today that I pay her medical costs because I can. The gifts of these programs, I show up when I say I'm going to show up. If she has an appointment at 10 o'clock, I show up at 9, even if it takes 10 minutes to get there. It doesn't matter. I got to be accountable today. That's how I amend, is I change the behavior. Now, there were a lot of things on my list that, um, you know, I wasn't quite sure if I needed to make an amends for. Like, I, I, I'm a big fan of going to um, jam band concerts, and, like, um, I'm a huge fish fan, and I would go to these concerts, and things get passed around. And I had this habit of, like, if someone gave me something, either an alcohol substitute or a fifth, I would just kind of walk away with it and just be like, peace, and it's mine now. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I would, I would ask, you know, I asked my sponsor, I'm like, you know, how do I make stuff like that right? And she would just hold my hand and say, don't drink or do drugs anymore. That's how you can make that right. Don't, you won't have the opportunity to steal that from other people. Um, I still go to fish shows. Um, I'm able to go anywhere. And as long as I'm in fit spiritual condition, they have meetings at these shows. And it's very cool to hold hands with the hippies and be like, yeah, we're sober. Um, but uh, it's funny, my last fish show, I happened to walk, uh, I was walking down the path and there was um, a very full beer. And those things are expensive. Um, and I, it was just kind of sitting there. And I picked it up. And I handed it to the first person that I saw. And I was like, yeah, I'm making amends. I'm bringing it back around. Um, they did not have Facebook or I didn't have a cell phone when I got sober. Um, I had a nine-year-old make my email address. I mean, I was not, like, savvy in any way. I was kind of out there. Um, so there were quite a few people um, on my list that I had no way to find these people. Um, one is I didn't know where they were, and the other big factor was I wasn't terribly burdened with, like, last names or anything when I was in my act of drinking. Um, so there was a girl named Holly on my list. I had a general idea of what she looked like, um, brown hair, kind of shortish. That was, like, it. Holly, brown hair, kind of shortish. And... Um, she was on my list um, for, for quite some time. And um, I guess I was about four and a half years sober, and I um, was volunteering at the fall convention in Hagerstown. And I was working the registration, and I was just kind of doing my thing and, you know, taking money and schmoozing and talking. I'm kind of a big mouth. I like to talk. Uh, and um, I look up, and there's Holly. And um, I still don't know what her last name is. She's sober, and it's anonymous, so I didn't ask. Uh, and, um, you know, I take her money. Oh, my gosh, good to see you. And the first thought that came to me is, you don't really owe her an amends. I mean, maybe, you, you know, if you think about it a little bit, and, you know, if you see her another time, you can make the amends. And um, my conscious contact with God had been paying off and that little voice in my head that I tried to ignore so many time with, times with alcohol said, you may not have another opportunity to do this. And uh, I grabbed her and I said, listen, you know why? Because they do. The people you need to make amends to, they typically know why you need to make amends. And I sat there and we talked. We talked for about an hour and a half and she'd been sober for about a year. And um, when it was all said and done, you know, I, I, there's no greater feeling than having all those things checked off, all those names checked off, that you did it. You got all of them. Um, and I was, a, I was like, beyond thrilled. Um, maybe it was a pink cloud, I don't know, but I was a host of one of the speakers that year, and I ran up to my speaker. I was host. His name was Carl. And I went, Carl, I just made my last amends. And he's like, 
okay, I'm, can you go introduce me now? I, and, like, I was out of my head, out of my head. And I've said, finally, I can look the world in the eye and be at perfect peace. You know, and I, the, it's no coincidence that the famous promises, there are more promises in the book than just after step nine, um, but it's no coincidence that those steps, that those promises were put after step nine. Um, I suddenly realized that God was doing for me what I could not do for myself. I do believe that God put Holly there at just the right time and at just the right moment. I do believe that no matter what happened, um, you know, I, I lost job. I was not very employable um, in the beginning, and I lost job after job. Again, big mouth. They kind of frown upon it when you cuss your boss out. Um, but I was somehow able to keep my arrangement with the restaurant that I stole from, um, and I never made, missed a payment. Um, and I think I was about eight or nine years sober by the time I paid it all off. But I did it. Um, I know that I, today I can walk down the street and not be afraid of who I'm going to see. Um, and that's the happy choice and free I was looking for. So, uh, again, thank you for letting me share. My name's Dave. I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> in uh, listening um, to the speakers this morning, I, <clears throat> I reflected back on my uh, <clears throat> first uh, <clears throat> attempt at the 12 steps, and, and I realized <clears throat> that uh, that I was thorough. I was, uh, I, I had been so beaten down by alcohol and I was so afraid that I was going to die from it or go insane that uh, when I came in here and, and I got a glimpse of God, <clears throat> uh, which was very impactful in my life, that, uh, <clears throat> that I really made a decision that I wanted to go through these steps and, um, and when I came in, I was plagued with <clears throat> a, a tremendous amount of fear that uh, manifested itself in the final years of my drinking. And uh, <clears throat> so even in early sobriety, uh, <clears throat> when I'd be sitting at a meeting like this and I, and I should be enjoying uh, what was going on, I'd be sitting there holding on to my chair because there was something inside of me just screaming and, and I didn't understand it and um, fortunately, I didn't go see any professional help. They probably institutionalized me. But anyway, I, so I, I, was, I was very driven to do these steps, and particularly four and five, because uh, I read where these fears fall from us. And I thought to myself, I wonder if that's true. And I, and I did four and five, and like I said, I, as thorough as I could at that time. And... Uh, uh, and I did six and seven, and I and I meant it, because the only thing I had it to base upon was what I discovered in four and five. That's that was it. That was everything. And um, and when I got to eight, uh, like Logan, I had made the list in four and five, <clears throat> and I had uh, a pretty good list. I I uh, I was a mean spirited drunk, and that's why I hurt people. And I would hurt you physically, and I'd hurt you emotionally, and I'd hurt you mentally. And, and I wouldn't give a thought of it. Uh, <clears throat> and if I did, <clears throat> I rationalized that away quickly. And uh, <clears throat> I just saw I, I, was, I saw you as prey. I just, I just took advantage of you. And, um, and yet... <clears throat> I, I thought I was a pretty fine fellow underneath it all. And um, <clears throat> so I got to that uh, list, and, uh, <clears throat> and I want to spend some time talking about that because <clears throat> I believe eight is a check and balance on six and seven. 
And so if I profess that I'm willing to have God remove all these defects of character, then when I go out there and i got to put that into action, let's see where that willingness is. Because if I haven't really surrendered those character defects to God, I'm going to have some problems making these amends. And some of the amends I set off to uh, rather quickly. I knew I had wronged some people. I <clears throat> There was a particular church that I had been terminated from sober. They, uh, <laughs> and I wasn't drunk. I can't blame that on alcohol. But I was filled with my own arrogance and my own resentment. And they said, the kindest thing we can do is take your name off our membership roll. And I said, that's fine with me. And I left there filled with myself and still thinking I believed in God and still thinking I had an effective relationship with him. And I was only kidding myself. And so when I got in here and I got to those amends, one of the first things I did was I contacted that ministry and I apologized to them. And I told them that I would be seeking uh, <clears throat> a different faith, <clears throat> but that uh, I was heartily sorry for, for what I had said to them. And, uh, and I thought that was the end of the amend. And if I have time, I'll go on because there was more to be done with that. And, uh, but then I approach this, uh, this willingness, and I like to think of the willingness, and this is the way I describe it to myself, what is my spirit of intent in making these amends? Because, you see, I wanted to make them really bad. I wanted to get this past me. I wanted to, like Casey, just take, tick all those tick marks on that list and get beyond this and get into those last three steps. And what I discovered, if I didn't have the correct spirit of intent, I was unable to make the amend. And so I went to this guy at work, you see, and this is a guy that I physically had coerced. <clears throat> he worked for me. I didn't like him. And uh, <clears throat> he didn't like me much either. And when I had physically threatened him, because <clears throat> I always knew that made people work harder, uh, he had <clears throat> he had gone to my boss, <clears throat> and he had uh, reported it. And my boss had brought me in, <clears throat> and he sat me down. And this guy he he related what this guy had told him. And this guy starts crying. Now I can't uh, stand to see a man cry in front of me. And I just figured this guy was phony as a three-hour bill. And I. And so my boss turns to me and says, you owe him uh, an apology. And I'm going to tell you what, I, I didn't apologize much in my life, but that must have been the hardest apology I ever made. And, and the words, I, I, they were stuck in my throat. I could hardly say them. So now I'm sober. <clears throat> and I owe this guy an amen. I know it. And I would go to where he worked in this work group because I managed the whole place. And I'd walk up and I'd think, today's the day I'm going to make that amend. And I'd been praying for the guy. And I'd walk up and I'd see him. And all I wanted to do was throttle this son of a gun. And he would see me, and he'd look at me, and he'd almost have a smirk in his face because he knew he owned my soul. <laughs> <clears throat> And I prayed, and I prayed, and I was sincere in my prayers, and I would approach him, and I knew it wouldn't be today, and I would approach him, and it wouldn't be today. And then one day I had to call him in my office for some discipline, and I prayed mightily that day because I'm, I'm thinking I've already got a problem with this guy. I know he knows he owns me, and I, I've got to discipline him. And I called him in, and when he sat down, it was apparent that he'd been drinking. And he sat in the chair across the table from me, and I looked at him, and I said, Bill, you're in here because I've got to discipline you. I said, but first, we've got to talk about your drinking. I said, you've been drinking today, and I can tell it. And we won't tolerate that. <clears throat> And Bill looked at me, and he kicked back in the chair, and he got this smirk on his face, and he said, what makes you such a damn expert? And I said, well, Bill, I'm an alcoholic. 
and I found a program of recovery. Let me tell you a little bit about my drinking. And I sat there with him, and the more I talked, <clears throat> the more I knew that a man was leaving me. And he sat there, and I could tell he couldn't, he wanted to get out of that office any which way he possibly could. <clears throat> and finally, I said to him, I said, Bill, <clears throat> If you'd like to, I'd like to take you to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and introduce you to this fellowship, at which point he immediately rejected that thought. But what happened after that is I no longer had that anger. I had forgiven him. And whenever he saw me coming, he went the other way because he didn't want nothing to do with me. And, uh, and it took time. But one that was even more troublesome was my mother. <clears throat> I had hurt my mother seriously. And, uh, <clears throat> and like Logan was saying, I broke her heart a hundred times. And uh, <clears throat> when I got sober, uh, at first she seemed to be supportive. And then it seemed like uh, <clears throat> once I got past the initial... Um, months of sobriety, our relationship began to really fall apart. My mother and I were like oil and water, and she was not an alcoholic. And uh, <clears throat> and it just seemed like whenever we were put in the same company, uh, <clears throat> I would erupt into some kind of anger, and she would pull back in some indifference towards me. And it got to a point that I really didn't want to talk to her anymore. And I, I can remember I'd go home on Friday nights and my wife would say to me, call your mother. And I'd say, I don't want to call my mother. And she'd say, call your mother. And I'd think I'd rather go out and fight three guys than call my mother. And I'm going to tell you that right now. And I'd call my mother up and I'd say, uh, Mom, uh, <clears throat> how you doing tonight? And she would say, what the hell do you care? And, uh, and, and the conversation kind of went downhill from there. <laughs> and, uh, and so we really had a terrible relationship. And what happened uh, after maybe six months of sobriety, she informed me that she no longer had a son and wanted nothing to do with me. And, uh, <clears throat> and I remember it was particularly painful that year because as we approached Thanksgiving this year, my wife and I had just had our first child, and um, it was the only grandchild in the family. And <clears throat> we invited my mother and my sister over for Thanksgiving dinner, and they declined. They would have no part of us and uh, or that child. And, uh, and it really it affected me tremendously, but it certainly affected my wife. In fact, she sent me down to the Damascus house in Brooklyn, to go get some alcoholics to bring them home for Thanksgiving dinner. And I went down there, and I couldn't get anybody to come home with me, <clears throat> which should tell you something about me. But anyway, <laughs> and then I left there and went down to Hanover Street to the Friendship House, and I couldn't get any of them to come home with me either. And, uh, and when I came home, my wife was so dejected, so uh, bewildered and, and, and hurt, and... Uh, <clears throat> And I saw that, and I thought, my God, what have I done in my life? But I continued to pray for my mother. And eventually, through a set of circumstances, uh, we had to attend a, a family gathering, which she said she would attend with me only on this one occasion because uh, of people being in from out of town. And I remember praying about it, and I said to God, I said, look, God, I don't even know what to say to this lady. I don't know whether to say good afternoon. I, I have no idea what to say to her. And I said, so <clears throat> I'm just going to leave it totally in your hands, and what happens, you'll put words in my mouth. And she came over, and I tried to be cordial, and she seemed to go out of her way to be somewhat cordial. And we went, and we visited with this family. And when we came home, <clears throat> She turned to me and said, well, I guess I'll see you next week. And God had intervened. 
And and after that, uh, I, w- I would at least had permission to go to her house again. And I would go over to her house to make the amend. And I would, before I would go in, I would say, today's the day I'm going to make the amend. And I'd walk in that house, and I wouldn't be in there 30 seconds, and I'd say, today's not going to be the day I make this amend. <laughs> and, uh, and this happened uh, several times. <clears throat> Continue to pray. I actually even did a fourth and fifth step just on my mother. And what I discovered was this. Even though she was not an alcoholic, I blamed her for my alcoholism to some extent because of the situation I was raised in. And, uh, and I had to come to grips with it. And, uh, <clears throat> and a time after that, I went over to her house. I had no intention of making an amend. And I went over, and I was leaving her house, and she was following me, and I stopped by the door, and it was time. And I told my mother, I I sat her down, and I I began talking about the way I had treated her. And I stood up, and I hugged her, and I said, Mom, I love you. And And I left, and I made that amend. And that wasn't a perfect amend. It wasn't a a as much as I could do, but it was a start. And every year after that, I, I, I used to belong to the Elk Ridge group, and at my anniversary, my wife used to invite my mother to come to my anniversary. And every year she would reject that. And uh, on my fifth anniversary, she decided to come. And so she came to the Elkridge group. Now, at that time, the Elkridge group, we used to get uh, people from Changing Point. They used to bring two buses down, like school buses, and and they used to come to the meeting. And uh, so my mother came to my anniversary, and uh, afterwards she turned to my wife and she went, man, he must be a big deal in here. They bust people in here. Yeah. Him, huh? <clears throat> I never told her any different. I let her. <laughs> and then after that, my mother began. We used to have a lot of uh, social things at our house for alcoholics. And my mother uh, began coming to them. And uh, she began meeting alcoholics uh, in my home, people I sponsored, people I knew, friends of mine. And uh, <clears throat> then she began inviting herself to other people's homes when they were having things. And uh, she began to become... Uh, quite a champion for Alcoholics Anonymous. My mother uh, passed away uh, a number of years ago. But before she died, she knew she was dying. She was dying of cancer. And uh, <clears throat> she wasn't going to put me in charge of the will or anything. She left that to my sister. We never made that much progress. But anyway... <laughs> She did sit me down, and she said, Dave, she said, I'm old, and she said, and I don't have too many friends left. She said, but I've made a list of the people I want as pallbearers when I pass on. And there was, uh, I guess, six or so pallbearers. Five of them were guys I sponsored in Alcoholics Anonymous, and she knew every one of them, and she knew them well, you see. And uh, this is the tremendous change that God brought in my life through these amends and not giving up and continuing to pray for that willingness. Now, another uh, amend that I had, which uh, I find somewhat humorous, uh, when I was in the United States Army, I decided since I was out of the country that there was absolutely no need to pay the state of Maryland for income tax because I was not using any of their facilities. And uh, so I did. And uh, when I would go to meetings on the ninth step, and when I initially got sober, I had other financial amends to make. And uh, anyway, on this particular amend, we didn't have the money, my wife and I, to pay it. Uh, initially, especially when I was making the other financial amends. And so I postponed it. 
And um, <clears throat> as much as I could, I tried to forget about it, tell you the truth, but I, I couldn't because every time I went to an eighth or ninth step meeting, it come rearing right back in my face, and I think, you know, I still owe them some money. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, the governor of our state at one point offered an amnesty program, and I thought, and I knew this is the time I, that I must do this. And so uh, <clears throat> by then we had a little bit of money, enough to pay it anyway, at least I thought. And so I called up the state of Maryland, and I said, <clears throat> you know, back in so-and-so, uh, was in the military. I didn't pay you uh, state income tax. So he said to me, you still got W-2? And I said, yeah. He said, uh, <clears throat> read it to me. So I read, and it, it, we make a pitifully small amount of money in the United States Army. And uh, <clears throat> so he said, all right. He said, uh, so the tax on that's going to be this. And uh, he said, <clears throat> and the interest on that is going to be this. Well, the interest was a whole lot more than the tax, and uh, which surprised me. So then he said, uh, <clears throat> so give me your name, and I'll send you a form, and you can fill this out and do it. And, uh, and there was silence on my end of the phone. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and I had committed to doing this, but I, that interest really threw me. And uh, I... Uh, <laughs> I couldn't help but do this, uh, and this is probably not, not, not the right spirit of intent, but I said, you know, you're never going to catch me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he said, you, you may be right, but we could. And uh, so then I gave him my name and I sent it in. <clears throat> now, if you do that, the only thing I'll warn you on, you get uh, audited for about five years thereafter. And, uh, but the good thing is, is uh, I've never chosen to have anybody to prepare my taxes. I prepare them, my wife and I, we prepare them ourselves because we don't cheat. And we might make a mistake, but it's an honest mistake. We don't cheat, you see. And in, that, in the next couple minutes, I want to get back to that amend I made to that church. <clears throat> Um, I could best be described when I got here as violently anti-religious. Right. <clears throat> I believed in God, but I wanted nothing to do with religion. But I had made that amend, and eventually I went back to the church of my youth, which was the Catholic church. <clears throat> and, uh, and I was sitting in there one day, and I, I had children by then, and I decided that... Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to go through their uh, adult education program again, which means I had to take the sacraments over. And uh, <clears throat> so I did that, and I thought, you know, they look at me, and, well, you already had them once, a couple of weeks, and we'll get you back in. But no, uh, it was six months of uh, study that I had to do. And it was a really wonderful deacon. The guy was, you know, we think we give a lot in here. This guy gave... <laughs> He, he, he really showed me how we give. And, uh, but anyway, I went through this for six months, and I got back in the Catholic Church. <clears throat> and uh, my children got to see me get confirmed again and take First Communion. And uh, afterwards, uh, and I kind of thought that was it. But afterwards, I'm sitting in there one day, and they made a plea for educators and it was like God was saying to me, and that's you. And so without my family even knowing it, I went up afterward and went, all right, I'll, I'll teach children. And uh, <clears throat> so for the next, I don't know, it was five or seven years, I taught seventh graders in my home in uh, Catholic education. And uh, <clears throat> I knew the whole time it was an amen. I got to tell you a secret, too. <clears throat> I may not be the best Catholic uh, educator. I, I actually taught them like little drunks, you know what I mean? And I, I, <clears throat> but we had a really open, and you know, we used to. I used to pray in front of them and everything. We we had a good time. And uh, <clears throat> but at some point, I knew that a man was done. I knew it. And 
and I was able, uh, gratefully, to end that uh, relationship. But, uh, you know, it's funny. Some of them kids still come back and see me today, and uh, which is kind of nice. And uh, But my amends, so much of my life, when I was younger, it's funny. I, I used to take accountability for a lot of stuff. I used to get caught, and I would just say, hey, you caught me. No big deal. Rarely did I apologize. Never did I change a behavior. But in here, it's all about changing the behavior. When I went to apologize to my wife for the many things that I did to her, she said, don't give me an apology. Change your behavior. You have the rest of your life to work on it. And I take that to heart, believe me. We've been married 43 years. See, I take that to heart. In the 36 years that I've been sober, one day at a time, you see, the truth of these steps unfolds in my life. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.